Kalispera. Let me turn this on first. Kalispera <laughs> to everyone who's come out here tonight in person and of course online as well. Welcome everyone. Um, and welcome to the first in-person Bader um, archive lecture since the pandemic. So this is very nice, very exciting to have it in person again. So the archive lecture series uh, here at the British School at Athens, and I should just pause and say, I'm Amalia Kakissis, the archivist of the British School. Forgot to mention that. Um, so the archive series here at the British School was started in 2009 as a platform to showcase uh, research developed from material here in our archives at the BSA. And in 2014, the series was reconfigured into an archive lectureship. And uh, which was supported and uh, by a legacy given to us uh, by the late Father Edward Bader. Father Bader was an ordained Catholic priest uh, with an interest in art and archaeology who came to the British School as a student. He was doing his PhD at Cambridge University back then. And uh, he came to the BSA in 1965-66 academic session. The last 27 years of Father uh, Bader's life, who has uh, passed away now, uh, he uh, was assigned to the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas, uh, where there he served as a priest, an archivist, a curator of art and archaeology, and adjunct uh, faculty in the archaeology department. So a man of many uh, hats there. So for this year's uh, Bader Archive Lectureship, uh, this year's holder is Dr. Michalis Sotiropoulos and he is the BSA 1821 Fellow in Modern Greek Studies. He's also the principal investigator in the BSA Research Project, uh, Unpublished Archives of British Hel Philhellenism during the Greek Revolution of 1821. Uh, this project has been generously funded by the Stavros Nierfos Foundation. Uh, and as part of that, uh, project. Uh, he was the academic lead in organizing the international conference, which we just had this past March, um, Phil Hellenism and the Greek Revolution of 1821 towards a global history, which was held at the National Library premises at the Stavros Nierkos Cultural Center. So Michali, apart from being uh, our fellow, has done many other things. He has held postdoctoral teaching positions at Queen Mary, the University of London, Princeton University, the University of Athens, Democritus University of Thrace. His research interests lie in intellectual history of the long 19th century with an emphasis on the Mediterranean and the processes, including revolts, revolutions, secessions, unifications, constitution making and state building that changed the political culture and eventually the geopolitical map of the region. He has published widely on these issues, and his book, his new book, Liberalism After the Revolution, The Intellectual Foundations of the Greek State, circa 1830 to 1880, was recently published by Cambridge University Press, and we're waiting for his book launch now. So, so as I've mentioned before at the conference we had in March, um, it has been a great pleasure to have Michali as a colleague here at the BSA, and this project has given us a unique situation uh, to work alongside a historian while processing an archive collection. And it's made it a very fulfilling and educational experience since we both kind of look at collection from different points of views. And I'm sure Michali will tell you this this evening. <laughs> so now I turn it over to Michali to tell us about Revolutioning the Archives, the VSA George Finley Collection and the Greek Revolution and the Digital Collection. Michali? Let me get the timer. Okay. So, hello everyone. Wait, Javian is telling me to. Okay. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here, first of all. I know that post election days in Greece are kind of weird. So, uh, thanks very much for being here, both in person and online. Um, actually, it's my only book, Amalia, <laughs> so it's not a new book. <laughs> uh, so before I start, I want to give some special thanks. And I'm going to start from Amalia, Amalia Kakisis, our Amalia. And I want to do so for two reasons. 
first for inviting me and giving me the honor to deliver this lecture today. And second, for the way we have been working together for, is it like one year and a half now? In, fa in fact, we have discussed about so many issues and had so many coffees together that our blood systems must have become interchangeable. So this lecture is based on the research project Unpublished Archives of British Philhellenism during the Greek Revolution of 1821 currently carried out at the British School at Athens in collaboration with the National Library of Greece and with generous support from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. I may be the principal investigator of the project, but I'm not alone in writing what we can call the Finley bus. Other than Amalia, there are many people here at the BSA I want to thank for their role in the project. Felicity Crow, the project's research, research assistant early on, Evi Haridudi and Evgenia Viliotti, our library guardian angels, but also Calliope for that matter. Maria Papakostadinou, Vicky Javara, Tanya Gerusi, Yorgos Muratidis, Yanis Dalesios, and Nathan Maker, previous and current guardians of the other quarter of the BSA, but also Kate Smith back in London. Last but not least, I need to thank the BSA's previous director, John Bennett, and of course, Roddy Beaton, for setting this project up, but also, and also for choosing me, uh, but also for taking me under their wings since day one, with Rodi, of course, uh, being the mentor of the whole project and my closest interlocutor. And I hope they're watching us right now. Actually, they better be watching us right now. And of course, I want to thank our new director, Rebecca Sweetman, for keeping the whole thing up. That said, I'm not sure I want to thank Rebecca for insisting that I actually look like Finley. <laughs> I also need to express, to express all the project's team gratitude to the two institutions we have been working with, to the National Library of Greece, for the very good cooperation we have got until now, an exemplary case of which was the international conference we co-organized at the library's premises two months ago. And of course, to the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, not just for the cooperation we have had, but actually for deciding to fund this project in the first place. As I have said before, the research project that the SNF decided to support is, to my knowledge at least, the only project on the Greek Revolution that had a long-term lifespan and not limited to the celebrations, uh, not limited to the celebrations, aiming primarily at high quality research outputs. This shows, I think, a genuine interest on the part of the SNF in the advancement of knowledge and in the history of the Greek Revolution in particular. So let me now, now just very briefly tell you what I'm going to do today. Firstly, I'm going to walk you through the project. In doing so, I will also refer to the many practical issues that the project team had to deal with. As I will argue, these practical issues raised bigger questions about archiving and the politics of knowledge. Second, and after a critical assessment of the literature on philhellenism, I will suggest ways in which the project can enhance our understanding of the phenomenon and its relation to the Greek Revolution. In doing so, I will also reflect on the ways in which the very process of turning the collection into di digital format gave birth to new research questions, to new angles through which to answer these questions and to the need to adopt new perspectives in the way we both understand and study philhellenism. On this, I will also draw upon what commentators have called the double revolution, namely the, namely the interconnection between the digital and the transnational slash global terms and its role in the way we do history today. Last but not least, I will share with you some thoughts about our digital condition and the implication that the digital transformation has for archiving and for history as a discipline. I should say from the outset that these implications are not all positive. And that, as is usually the case, it is the negative implications, the losses, that offer food for thought. First things first, what is this project and how did it come to haunt our lives? This project was born out of three interrelated convictions. The first was historiographical and was based on our understanding that despite decades of engagement with philhellenism, scholarship remains ambivalent about its nature and the contribution and its contribution to the course of an outcome of the revolution. To be sure, the contribution, the contribution of some of the philhellenes to the successful outcome of the Greek revolution has long been recognized. 
I probably, I probably don't have to mention Lord Byron or indeed others such as Thomas Gordon, Edward Blaguer, Richard Church, and so on and so forth. And yet, even at the level of individuals, we still lack knowledge of the personal affinities of many of the volunteers, their experiences before the revolution, the reasons why they mobilized, what exactly they did in revolutionary Greece and how effective this was. We also don't know much about their political thought or their political and economic involvement in Greek affairs. The same goes for those at the home fronts, those who established Hellenic committees across Europe and the US. Hence our second conviction, also historiographical, which was that, the, that a better understanding of Philhellenism would not only enhance our understanding of the, of the revolution, but that it would also be a very productive way to connect the Greek revolution with the recent and growing literature on the age of revolutions. The third conviction was that it would take a relatively long-term engagement and the adoption of an interdisciplinary perspective in order to achieve our goals. Hence, the three-year time span of the project and the interdisciplinary team of historians, archivists, and IT experts that it brought together. In trying to turn these convictions, these convictions into a solid research project, we focused on two archival collections that are related to British philhellenism. Although these collections have long been known to specialists, they remain underexplored, to say the least. As you may have guessed, the one collection is the George Finlay collection, held at the BSA. As many people here know, this collection includes both the papers of George Finlay, of the Scottish volunteer and historian George Finlay, and those of Captain Frank Abney Hastings, but also those of John Finlay, as well as the Journal of George Jarvis. For the project, we, of course, focused on the first two collections. The other collection is that of the papers of the London Greek Committee held at the National Library of Greece. Collectively, these archives reveal a great deal about the character, motivations, and especially the military and political judgments of the individuals involved, as well as of many others, both British and Greek, with whom they interacted. Based on these two collections, the project has two goals two aspects, if you like, what I, what I like to call the archival aspect and the intellectual aspect. The one, the archival, was to bring some of those uh, invaluable primary sources for the first time into the public domain through the creation of a digital archive that will include original items from the Finlay collection with description, commentary, and selective transcription that will be fully searchable. The second goal, the intellectual, of the project was to produce new knowledge on Philhellenism by a way of an in-depth study of the Finlay collection together with the papers of the London Greek Committee, as well as by way of collaborative work by many scholars on the broader topic. I'm very happy to say that many of the research outputs we had initially designed have already come into fruition. And I have here some examples. This is our website. This is the digital collection that we that is online by now since I think March uh, 2023. Uh, the conference we organized, and Amalia talked about this, and of course many other smaller research outputs. But please do visit all of them, especially the digital co collection, because we need the feedback. These are all very well, but who was George Finlay, and what is his collection about? George Finlay was born in 1799 and spent most of his youth in Scotland. Coming from a family of Protestant merchants and bureaucrats, George Finlay was employed initially as a law clerk before moving to Gettingen to study law. It was there that he developed an interest in the Greek cause and an enthusiasm for liberal causes that led him to finally go to help the Greeks in 1823. He initially stayed in Greece until 1825 only to return in 1827 when he, when he decided to settle permanently in Athens until his death in 1875. Always involved in Greek politics and very active intellectually, Findlay would wear many different hat, hats in the course of his life. He would make a name for himself as a journalist, a member of several associations, a founding member in many instances, a collector, a commentator, and a traveler. Finley's most lasting contribution would be the, the series of works on the history of Greece that he began publishing in 1844, including his history of the Greek Revolution that appeared in 1861 and remains to, the, to this day one of the most authoritative accounts of the conflict. All of this wide range of activity is reflected in Finley's collection held at the BSA.
The Findlay collection contains notebooks, personal journals, personal and official correspondence, spanning a period of 50 years, as Finley kept meticulous records of his travels, personal acquaintances and expenditure, memoranda on strategy and on military and political organization, journal entries, maps, scrap, scrapbooks, personal notes on people, Greeks and others, and on revolutionary events, as well as newspaper cuttings, mainly on Greece and international affairs. It also contains, contains corrected proofs of Finley's published works, including the original manuscripts of the history of the Greek Revolution. As I already said, also included in the collection are the papers of Finlay's fellow Philelene, Frank Abney Hastings, a British naval officer who remains one of the unsung heroes of the Greek Revolution. Born into a noble British family, Hastings served in the Royal Navy until he was discharged in 1819 due to a quarrel with his commanding officer. In 1822, he decided to join the Greek Revolution. Until he was killed in action in 1828, Hastings brought to the conflict a unique blend of naval experience and strategic insight. He was one of the first to propose using steamship in warfare and captain the first one ever built for the purpose, the Carteria. You can see it uh, up on the right. The Hastings papers include personal and official correspondence, his logbooks, personal notes, as well as memoranda on strategy and on the naval organization of the revolutionary forces. Overall, the full importance of this collection has never been appreciated. Up to 1973, when Joan Hasse declassified and cataloged the material, it was even difficult for scholars to go through it and actually to use it. Given these shortcomings, the project was designed to follow three steps. First, to update the catalog to be in line with international archive standards. Second, to convert the catalog to digital format and third, to digitize a significant part of the collection. It sounds nice and easy. Trust me, it's not. In the process, we had to face many issues, many of us for the first time. First problem, selection criteria. How do you choose? In fact, we ended up, we ended up with three different criteria, chronological, thematic, material. The last was the easiest to deal with as it had apparently to do with the condition that is the fragility of the material, of the documents. The other two are more complicated, as they had to do with the relevance of the documents to the Greek Revolution. But how do you choose what is relevant and what is not? An obvious way out is to be based on chronology. This raised another issue, that of periodiza periodization. If the beginning of the revolution is fairly easy to determine, when did it end? We did have a, a conventional date in mind, 1832, but sometimes this did not work. To give you an example, should Findlay's participation in uh, the Thomas Gordon's expedition against Brinkens in 1833 be included? We thought it should. And this means that in the process of digitizing, we adopted an expansive understanding of relevance. Second problem, standardization of names and place names for the search box. Now it becomes funny. Is it Odysseus with a Y or a Y? Or is it Ulysses, as is most uh, commonly the case in Finlay's papers? Is it Bocharis with an S or a Z? Is it Mavrocordato with a V or a U? To make it more complicated. Wait, wait, there's more. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with Amphisa or Agrinio as significant towns of the time. The problem is that they did not exist under these names. It was Salona and Vrahori, respectively. So this is something you have to take into account when you build the, the keywords, the metadata. Even more puzzling, many times even the capital of revolutionary Greece is not to be found as Nafplion, either with an F or a U. It is to be found as Napoli di Romania, Marcella is not here. She would, be, she would feel proud. To make it schizophrenic, how do we define an institution? Is it ephoria or ephoros? Is it eparchia or eparchos? This is a question about institutional imagination and how people thought about institutions. Did they identify it with an apparatus as we do today? Or was an institution a person as was the case in the Ottoman political imagination? 
The key here is that in working for the metadata, we had to think historically and creatively. And I'm happy to say that now we will be now working with the experts on such issues, the 1821 Digital Archive, and I see some familiar faces in the room. Third problem, how to consider institutional memories and appreciate the history of an institution and its practices of archiving, not least because many times it is difficult to disentangle who made what. Yes, most of the documents were written or collected by Finlay or Hastings, but were they put together as they are today only by them? What was the role of those who cataloged it? Why did Hasse catalog it in this way? To what extent did she move documents around, which apparently she did, as Mia Malia and Felicity were gradually realizing? And what about the other handwritings we were discovering? Who was messing with the collection, when and main, mainly, why did they do so? These are historical questions. And I think the point I'm trying to make is that a collection like this speaks to us not just about Finlay, and his world, but also about what came after, about the history of the BSA itself, about its people, about academic relationships and choices, about the politics of archiving, and by extension, about the politics of knowledge. We hope and believe to be able to address such questions in the near future. Fourth problem, IT and information uh, issues, or backend and metadata issues. I will never forget Rodi's face whenever Amalia was trying to explain to us what this means. I was pretending to understand, to be honest. These practical issues were related to a wider issue that I came to realize little by little, that in order to bring such project into fruition, we need to somehow bring together different disciplinary fields and the languages that they go with. In most cases, these languages are those of history, archiving, and IT. History, for example, is usually interested in the content of, archive document, of archival documents. Sometimes, in its good, good days, it is also interested in what constitutes an, ar an archive and how it was created. That said, it's not very common for historians to be involved in the creation of archives, like Amalia said in her opening remarks. We therefore sometimes lack, we historians, not only the technical expertise of archivists who have their own language, but also the need to face ethical issues so common to them. We historians we not, would not necessarily object to break up a collection or to change its structure, but the Amalias of this world would have stopped us. The ethical question of the, of the story being that of the movie Back to the Future. How far and on what right can we intervene into the past without changing the present and the future? What are the effects of such an intervention? To what extent can we ignore original creators or the memory and practice of an institution? Taking then the digital term comes with issues, and I, I will come back to this later on. What is more, when taking the digital term, another language is involved, that of the IT, information technology, a largely unethical language, but at the same time, not exactly without limitations. Technical possibilities are in fact not limitless, until, at least until now. The infinite archive that some have spoken for is still a question. Overall, the point is that in making such an archive, a hard negotiation is in order. And this, this, this negotiation is, of course, ongoing. The digital collection is now live, but we will keep updating it, in particular with the transcriptions of the document until the end of the project in the autumn of 2024. And let me now get uh, to the second part of the lecture, or to the intellectual side of the project. Key questions here are, in what ways can the collection and its public availability enhance our understanding of the Greek Revolution? And also, in what ways did the very process of the digital turn give, give rise to new questions? How did it make us reflect on the sub subject in novel and unexpected ways? I will try to answer the first uh, um, question by way of one example that some of you may find puzzling. As I already said, the collection includes, among other material, Captain Hastings' logbooks. In fact, while on board, and Hastings, it must be said, was rarely, rarely off board, Hastings kept both a logbook, as most cap captains did, and a journal. And I have these um, uh, two items here, which come from the sa very same period. The journal on the right, the logbook on the left. 
The journal has, of course, important notes, comments, and thoughts of Hastings, as well as sometimes copies of letters he sent to several people, many of whom were key protagonists of the revolution. Precious material. But I want to focus on Hastings' logbooks. In fact, his first logbook from Greece, the one that you see here, comes from a moment when he was not acting as a captain. Upon his coming to Greece in 1822, Hastings, along with others, joined the Greek fleet that sailed for Chios um, in the spring of 1822. Hastings went on board the Idriot, Idriot vessel Themistocles of Yakumakis Dobazis, a captain that he seemed to have a lot of respect for, something quite rare for Hastings, it has also to be said. About the logbook, as opposed to memoirs written usually after the revolution, or to journal, journals, which are reflective and self-reflective sometimes, logbooks offer less filtered perceptions. They are composed in the heat of the moment, they're technical, and they, do, and they do not address either the self or the public. They thus often retain a plain elliptic style that is not always very appealing or accessible. At the same time, it can be extremely revealing. What can we learn from Hastings' logbooks? First, they contain a wealth of information about the politics and the economics of the Greek maritime world and of the war at sea. To give but some examples, Hastings often describes the Greek expeditions as plundering expeditions. He's not alone in using such, such characterizations. The same description can be found in Greek law books, such as, such as that of Iorgios Skandalis, vice admiral of Psara and captain of Philoctetes. In 1824, Scandalis writes of the operation of a Psarian fleet from Sara against Chandarli explicitly as being an ex ec plus lafiragogicos. And of course, such expeditions led in many cases to internal quarrels about the distribution of booties. The logbooks have much info on this latter. They also contain information on expenses and on other financial transactions, in, including the trading of slaves. At the same time, Logbooks also tell us a lot about the wider maritime politics. As in other cases of logbooks in Hastings too, one can find notes on the war councils that the captains held in several occasions during the war. To recall Spiros Azrahas, concept for the Aegean Islands, in such moments, one can see the Ploti Politia, the maritime republic at work. But this was a republic with a twist affected by the war compared to the one that Azrahas had in mind. Second, the logbooks tell us, tell us a lot about the spread of information and its mechanism, as well as about the role of this information, including of fake news in the war effort. Think, for example, the rumors about Russia's intervention, or the rumors about tortures in the hands of the Greeks, or about being sold as slaves that pushed some Turkish women attempt suicide when they were captured by the Greeks. Were these just rumors? How were they generated? And what can such accounts tell us about slavery in the region? And slavery and the slave trade in particular are kind of historiographical sacred cows that can open actually a wider search paths. Third, the logbooks can make us think of novel ways about identity issues and collective identification. Like Finlay and many others, and many others, Hastings has a tendency to make distinctions along lo local or regional lines, islanders, idiotes, psariotes, maniotes, etc. Unsurprisingly, when using the term homeland, he does so by usually referring to someone's local homeland, local patrida. For example, islands such as Idra or Psara. Occasionally, he refers to it in terms of a national homeland, Greece. In some cases, other terms jump into the texts, Hellenes or Romney, Hellenes or Romney. It would be interesting to see how and when Hastings, or Finlay for that matter, use these terms. It would also be interesting to make comparisons. In Scandalis account, Psarian fighters are called Hellenes, while the Orthodox population of the Anatolian coast are Greki, Christiani, or Romothriski. All these point to a larger issue. Whether it was the war itself and the sense of a common purpose that the war created that facilitated the passing from the local allegiances, the local homelands, to a wider identification, that of the nation, ethnos, that encompassed the patrides and went beyond them. Think, for example, the role of the war councils in facilitating this common purpose and a national imagination. Logbooks can then open new comparative research paths on political imagination and its transformation. Last but not least, 
Hastings logbooks can tell us a lot about the technologies of war in the Eastern Mediterranean, how they compare to other cases across the world, and more generally, about technological imagination and the drive for innovation that characterize so much the age of revolutions, and which remains rather understudied. understudied. It goes without saying that the examples can be multi multiplied if one focuses on other kind of material of the Finlay collection, and the material is very diverse. The dub, you may have noticed that up to now, when I'm proposing ways through which this collection can enhance our understanding of the revolution, I do so by placing Greek, de Greek developments on a wider canvas. This is related to our conviction that, as I already said, this project can help us better connect the Greek revolution with the, re with the recent literature on the age of revolutions. Although scholarly interest in this latter field is not new, Recent scholarship has given it a new lease of life in two ways. First, by expanding the geographical scope of studies to include revolutionary experiences in the colonial and peripheral world. And second, by embracing the insights of transnational and global history. Apart from recovering the history of hitherto unknown revolutionary cases, this renewed interest has also led many scholars to propose alternative chronologies of historical change. This has been the case of the revolutionary wave of the 1810s and 20s, a wave of revolutions in particular in Latin America and the Mediterranean that has been increasingly seen as a liberal constitutional moment of global significance. Although the Greek revolution was a key moment in this wave, it is usually absent from this literature. Many recent studies have played a large role in turning this stage of affair around. In developing the project, we wanted to build on these developments. We also wanted to take them further by adopting a global history perspective, hence the subtitle of the conference that we organize, Philhellenism and the Greek Revolution of 1821 towards a global history. Allow me to stop here for a second. Up to now, I have been treating the transnational global turn and the digital turn as separate processes. They're not. In fact, digital search has become, has become the unacknowledged handmaiden of transnational and global history. Why? Because it facilitates research across borders. This in itself dissolves the structural constraints that kept history bound to the political territorial unit of the nation state. In other words, digital archives can undermine national frameworks of analysis as they allow us to develop what historians have called side glancing glancing outside the boundaries of place-based expertise and peripheral visions, visions that is of cross-border dynamics that were usually lost because of our accustomed focus on the centers, be that Western Europe or the West in general. The digital turn routinizes such methods and visions. It also opens research to the possibility of manifold scales of analysis, local, national, regional, transnational, transimperial. To paraphrase John Berger, just multiplying the ways of seeing changes the questions we're asking and the stories we're telling. Well, but what does going global or transnational actually mean? How can, how can we practice it in the case of the Greek Revolution and of Philhellenism? And how can the Findlay collection facilitate such a turn? Overall, as both practitioners and critics have argued, the field is foregrounded to a language of connectedness and circulation and to a macro scale level of analysis. Both these tendencies have invited criticism. As Sebastian Conrad has argued, there seems to be among practitioners of such approaches an apparent obsession with mobility and movement. The problem with that is that it often leads to a downgrading of that which did not move, of place-based knowledge of primary sources as well as of the micro level. What is more, the focus on movement and on large-scale synthesis has been less effective at, at explaining change and why change happens differently in different contexts. In the last about 15 years or so, microhistorians and historians of political thought, among others, have come to the rescue. This they have done in three ways. First, by adopting a regional perspective, or more frequently, by playing with scales, je de sel, as the French would say. Second, by returning their attention to primary sources. And third, by focusing on particular individuals, social groups, or local societies. This global microhistory approach has helped historians populate their models and theories of global historical structures with real people and real life stories. 
How this played out, of course, varies. Some scholars have been drawn to what has been called the exceptional normal, rare and idiosyncratic figures and phenomena which do nonetheless illuminate broad trends. Some have turned to more paradigmatic cases of individuals or social groups, which they connected, connected with the emergence of new ideas and institutions. Others have turned to highlighting connections and making comparisons at the regional level. No matter the methodology adopted and their chronological focus, these works have shown that the Western Eurocentrism and the old understanding of peripheral and non-European societies as static are deeply problematic. What about the Greek Revolution? In my view, to argue that the Greek Revolution lacks the attributes to become a subject for a global approach is to be blindsided. One obvious thing to note is that the Greek Revolution was at the heart of the restructuring of empires and other states that took place in the Mediterranean during and after the Napoleonic Wars. As is well documented, this destabilization disrupted Greek shipping and commerce. It also inflicted major shocks on traditional institutions and political systems. It also led to the formation of the first nationally self-governing modern Greek state in the Ionian Islands. More generally, it opened up possibilities. It made people contemplate alternative political futures. It also brought movement, warfare and displacement, all global processes. Recent scholarship has shown the many different social groups that moved during this period in the region soldiers and mercenaries, adventurers, merchants, refugees, officials, men of letters, slaves, political exiles. The Greek world, which by the time of the conjuncture of 1821 was at its most expansive, was a key site of this wide movement. The Philelens, the Philelens were in a way the tip of the iceberg. A simple look at their trajectories is probably proof enough of global lives. Here I have sketched, and thanks to Eleni Kadoglu, uh, Kadoglu. Uh, for the maps. Uh, this is uh, Finland's trajectories. You can see him all the way from Glasgow to Gentingen, then to Greece, and then to the Middle East, Istanbul, Asia Minor, Italy, and so on and so forth. And even worse, this is Captain Hastings, all the way from the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean to the French coast. This, these are the Napoleonic Wars, right? He was fighting the French all the time, and then to Greece. Now, if these are not global lives, I'm not sure what is, but are they exceptional, normal, or paradigmatic? I would argue for the first, as Hastings brought to the revolution a rare mixture of naval expertise and experience, along with an innovative spirit. On his part, George Finlay brought with him a particular way of seeing at the revolution, one that would find its way later in his historical works. In what ways then did the research uh, that was conducted in the framework of the project generate new questions and new uh, angles. Firstly, it forced us to consider the transnational character of the revolutionary armies and of the state building process that ensued in revolutionary Greece, given that both Hastings and Finlay were uh, very much involved in such processes. Second, they raised issues about Philhellenism's contextualization. We are used to make distinctions along national lines, German, French, Italian, American, and British philhellenisms. But what if we take a more regionalized approach in our understanding of the phenomenon, one closer to the spatial configurations of this period? Think, for example, of the heavy presence of Irish and mainly Scottish in the British philhellenic movement. Thirdly, it made us rethink the role of the press and more broadly of how, how ideas circulated and what ideas circulated. Philhellenism has been associated with early liberalism and ideas of national emancipation. But as we came to realize, and as we saw in the maps, many Philhellenes live their lives and form their thought in a context of imperial and colonial expansion. Many of them had fought in imperial armies and had deep experiences of empire, but also of national emancipation struggles. For them, the Greek Revolution became a sort of crucible for their political visions. Thus, Philhellenism makes a perfect case for studying how the political and intellectual currents of the era, liberalism, republicanism, nationalism, romanticism, played out in an instance of revolution in the Mediterranean periphery, one which for a short period of time became the international and liberal cause par excellence. In fact, Far from being just a testing ground, the Greek Revolution became a factory that produced novel and conflicting ideas about politics, society, gender, religion, as well as about what it means to be modern and European 
but also wide and from the West. As with all real, real, real revolutions, methodological revolutions come with a cost. I will close the lecture today by referring to some of the challenges that this double revolution has generated for historians, and more generally, for our relationship with the past, but also of how, to how to address those challenges. To be sure, and as I already said, Search-based research has transformed and enhanced historical practice in very, in very productive ways. That these tools are by now widespread is almost self-evident, even though one has to bear in mind that this does not apply to all parts of the world. Not all researchers are one click away from their research material. That said, and without wanting to sound too alarmist, this new topography of information has blind spots. I refer to the first one when I argue that there is a tendency among global historians to focus on certain kinds of actors and certain aspects of their lives. The risk here is to produce a kind of international provincialism that fails to take note of those who did not move, rural people, illiterate people, people who stayed put. There were also others who did move, but in a more regional and limited way. Yes, Finlay did move a lot. But so did Kolokotronis, for example, or Karaiskakis, for the matter, and Polizoidis. Maybe in less wide scale than Finlay, but still, it wasn't small. So did many other less famous. The key argument here is that we must also consider and digitize the most difficult forms of the non-canonical, the non-Western, the non-elite, and the quotidian, the materials that capture the lives and thoughts of the least powerful in society. What is more, Focusing on that which connects obscures sometimes that which is connected, regions, in-place structures, economies, societal dynamics. Spatial history and its emphasis on place and space here are important. The same goes for social history approaches that take into account global social dynamics. A second blind spot, blind spot of the digital condition is that it can easily lead to a sort of decontextualized knowledge this is a blind spot that I think may speak to archaeologists. In the pre-digital world, historical research required place-specific learning and research. In the digital world, this is no longer necessary. And this threatens to displace place-based research, meaning research guided by place, one conducted by scholars who seek multidimensional knowledge about a particular society and a specific context. But it also means research conducted in place, one that requires actual residence in the local understudy in order to get a better sense of the field of study. The simple physicality of old-fashioned research allowed one to assess the sum of an institution's holdings at a single glance. I truly believe that all researchers who have visited the BSA understand what I mean. New questions and new vistas of research open just by being here. But this being here and getting your hands dirty also allows you to get a sense of perspective, to see how relevant your topic is or what other issues were, went under your nose. In other words, physicality can be unsettling. But there is more to this sort of deracinated knowledge as Tim Hitchcock has called it, the land blind spot, blind spot, but not the least. In the digital world, now you glance, now you feast, now you feast. But how much do you really know about the sources you find? about where they're coming from, literally, politically, culturally. As archaeologists and anthropologists know, both kind of ethnographers, the value of fieldwork of field goes well beyond understanding a source or its holder. As Salini Puri has argued, the fieldwork not only invites us to achieve the texture and embodied knowledge of place, it also offers the irreplaceable contribution of rendering the researcher vulnerable to, his, to history. Being here and experiencing this here confronts researchers with local societies, with locally produced expertise, with the real stakes of past processes of global connection. It produces a kind of moral peripheral vision parallel to the topical peripheral vision I referred to earlier. In other words, being here may be a vital condition against crypto-coloniality and the knowledge that goes with it. This is not, of course, to say that digitizing and making publicly available source like the Finlay collection is not important or that it shouldn't be done. Don't get me wrong. 
There's no turning back to a pre-digital world. In fact, we need more of them, more digitization. But my point is that we also think we need to think of ways to re reproduce the forms of contextualized knowledge that the physical visit, the field work, usually generated. I don't know how to do that, to be honest. More crucially, if we want to undermine crypto-colonial accounts and to place the Greek revolution and philhellenism in wider frameworks, we need to invest more financial resources into research itself. Digitizing archive, archives is one thing, studying them is another. Hence the value of this project and its concept of synthesizing the archival with the intellectual. In conclusion, I want to go back and insist on four themes that I think run through my presentation. The importance of transnational and global approaches in the study of the Greek Revolution. How best to utilize, how best to utilize the insights of global microhistory in order to better understand change. How a collection like that of Finlay can help us take such, approach, such approaches. And last but not least, what the changing conditions of research may mean for history, the benefits and the challenges. I will just end by saying that an institution like the BSA, which in a sense embodies transnationalism and interdisciplinarity, cannot but be at the forefront, uh, forefront of such approaches. Given its character, it's also an institution that knows the value of engaged fieldwork of deep learning and of the value of international collaboration in the fight against parochialism and the structural inequalities that we still see among institutions of higher education across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patty, uh, for that very interesting lecture. Now, um, okay. So, um, we will take questions from the room first, uh, and then we'll be we'll coming online. Let's do this. For the... yep. and, um, yep. we tend to ask as a speaker to Okay, then we It's just a short question. Um, what is the extent that we may use uh, the case of Sakai, uh, especially the logos? I get the feeling that we did not get one exploding material. Um, but apparently, and of course, uh, your uh, lecture was stimulating, very interesting. I keep saying it's in the beginning, but anyway, what is the extent? Do you have a feeling? First of all, for the audience uh, on Zoom, Aristides Hadzis is asking whether, uh, apart from saying that it was a very stimulating lecture, <laughs> he's asking whether and to what extent did Finlay use um, Hastings' papers and his logbooks in particular. So I don't think he, he used the logbooks, but he did use his um, many of the memoranda on strategy, on naval organization, things like that. And also, I think he, his notes on some of the Greeks uh, here and there, or at least because both were taking notes sometimes and were making taking ethnographic notes on the Greeks. Don't forget, these are foreigners coming into Greece and they're also observing. If I'm not mistaken, he grows almost not, I don't know how many they were, but there are a lot of characterizations of the Latin bases, for example. And we also used the uh, probe the general extensively for the 18, 27, 18, 28 campaign in oh, yeah, liberating yeah. Uh, Western Dubai. I, I totally but agree. That, that, I think that especially for the sea campaigns, uh, I totally agree. And one thing is that I think it has to do also with what I said about the logbooks, but that they're not very accessible and, and appealing to someone who does historical research. And maybe Finley was not looking for this kind of information, although I think if you do some kind of detective work and connect what Hastings is saying, because this is, a, you know, usually the notes are very technical, and especially of Hastings. 
Uh, and if you connect them with some of the things that were happening, let's say, for example, he's in um, off heels in one of the first naval battles, like serious one against the Ottoman fleet, and he's taking notes, and he's, you know, the notes that he's taking, taking also about the, the, the ways in which the Ottoman fleet is operating, stuff like that, are very important, but they're very technical. So someone has to decode them uh, in a way. And finally, I don't think he did them. So. But the other part of it too, I was going to say, that we discussed before and a little bit what you were saying, Finley has very few Hastings papers because of the way they were dispersed. So Finley is actually using a very small portion of what existed of Hastings papers to do anything with. You mean uh, until until he bought them? Yeah, I mean, yeah. like I don't know. We don't know what he was doing before that, but until he, we know what he purchased, which is very small compared to what what things that exist. Well, it's not small. Well, no. I'm, I mean, compared to what you yeah, had, yeah. yeah. Compared to what exists. And, and something that we implied, so Hastings dies, but he does not leave his collection of papers, his papers to Finlay. But Finlay, we found out later on by searching uh, that Finlay actually bought the collection in 1831, was it? Or 1830. Um, even though he was probably, he probably had it before, or at least he had access to, his, to it because there's a letter by Thomas Gordon, who, when he's writing his history, he's asking from Finlay some Hastings papers. So that means that, you know, there's a network of British Finlaylands, and therefore the, he knows that Finlay has them, even though not formally. He bought them formally later on, but that means that he knew who had them. And of course, another story here, Aristides, you know that there is a rumor, I don't know if that's, uh, I mean, we have to do research on that, that Hastings had Theodorus Negris library. And that Theodor Negris is one of the big statesmen of the early years of the revolution. Now, whether that is true or not, I don't know. We have to look into the books, uh, the, the Finlay Library, in fact. But I'm happy to do it. Uh, any questions? And how indeed that was the case? Maybe an election, even for some of you, you know, an expert, I believe. I'm just to hear that. Uh, uh, you needed to set the uh, selection criteria for uh, what was relevant or what uh, you, know, you need to study uh, for your research. I would think that uh, all Finnish uh, archives would be relevant for the study of theory, the Hellenism, the history of the revolution. So, could you tell us uh, what were the parts that were not considered? <laughs> Actually, the biggest part is not has not been digitized, if I'm not wrong. The reason being that Finley dies in 1875. So as you can imagine, he's uh, I mean, first of all, he's 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 a lunatic in a way because he keeps notes of everything. And therefore, he, from especially 1823 onwards, he we have his papers. So as you can imagine, yes, they're all kind of related to philellenism because Finlay is a philellene who settles in Athens, but not all of the documents are related to the Greek revolution. So, of course, there are many, you know, if you want someone who wants to study, for example, the Don Pacific affair, the Ottonian period, the period of um, uh, King Otto, and later on of King George of the revolution of 1862-64, there are many documents in the Finlay collection. And this is also an invitation to, to researchers to come and visit the Finlay collection because in Greece, it's not very known. Actually, it's not known probably at all. And so we had to make a selection and, and, and focus on the Greek revolution, but that does not mean that you take only papers directly related to the revolution. So there may be some issues when he's talking about, for example, local political cultures, but he's talking about that in the 1840s. Do you take that? Do you digitize that as a part of the Greek revolution? Uh, in my view, yes, because there he's making a larger argument. So that's why I said that the only solution was to go through each and every document, which I did, we did, you know, and trying to see whether we it should be digitized or not. And we had to leave many documents out because there was a limit in what we could digitize, financial limit, I mean. The experts are coming in. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mikhail, for this very thought-provoking uh, lecture.
Um, I would like to um, discuss a little bit uh, more the effects of the uh, uh, digitality on archives. I knew that. <laughs> The, the issue of access is very important, as you mentioned, and, and I think we are all taking advantage of this for the and as far as accessing the primary material. And also, it is important because um, um, not only uh, researchers, but also the wider public can also have access to um, archival collections that might otherwise not be available. Uh, but I think we might also think, and I'm reading of Professor Francis' comment also, um, we might also think about it, um, the, the national uh, interoperability, for instance. Um, if we uh, uh, benefit from uh, the metadata data and um, extensive work on keywords and metadata, perhaps we can also. And um, the, the, the uh, digitization can also give us, give us um, um, new uh, insights in the collections. Mm -hmm. For instance, we could trace uh, the connections between these two uh, papers within the digital condition, and we could um, uh, find out how, for instance, um, in, in, to, after which extent uh, Finley um, commented on his, the business. Um, and papers. And that is um, an inward uh, um, uh, condition. I mean, we can enhance work within the collection, but also it is an upwards uh, condition because we can uh, connect the, the collections to other archival collections. And I think it's important not only because of the information that gives us, but also because it changes our research methods. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. Uh, well, my response would be yes. And, you know, probably we're both thinking of the Stanford project, digital humanities project, digital history that started like maybe 20 years ago, probably more. The problem with that, the problem, it's not the problem, but something that we have to take into account is that there are some inequalities. So, for example, OCR. You know the the thing that actually reads uh, the text or the letters are still very much uh, focusing on the big languages. So I was, you know, I wonder we're trying to we want to transcribe the documents, the text, and put them be, at the back end behind what someone sees. But in order to have what you're saying, you know, uh, how do you call it? That is textual search. I don't remember the technical word. To look to have the engine searching uh, across texts. We cannot do that until up to now because we have to have the transcribed texts, literally speaking. So someone has to do that. Like researchers have to actually go and read each and every document. And Finlay, Finlay's handwriting was perfect, to be honest. Uh, but other, others' handwritings are awful. Uh, so, you know, this takes expertise, effort, but also maybe financial resources to, you know, for making those, these languages accessible and uh, easy to read in the OCR systems, etc. cetera. So can you move the mouse? Ah. Yeah. We have questions yeah. online as well. Can we yeah. think on it? So uh, yeah. one question, the first question is, uh, would you love, elaborate on the critical you know, danger of global history? How does this relate to the history of the 1821 revolution? Elaborate on the crypto-colonial. Um, <laughs> um, I think it had to do with what I was saying before uh, about the inequalities that up to now someone can see in the digital transformation. Uh, and the question is, do these inequalities reproduce and enhance or at least um, keep the crypto-colonial condition as it was in a way, because it's like production knowledge is being produced by far away researchers and you know it's fine with that but to be here and actually to get a sense of the place and to talk to people and even to take the bus or to be involved and understand what you know what the elections are in Greece why are the elections like that and in fact if someone reads Hastings and, and Finlay especially Finlay 
Finley was all about taking notes and actually he was saying that if you don't speak the language of, of a people, you cannot understand them. Understand, yeah. Uh, so you have to learn the language. And, and that's what I'm saying, that sometimes the digital condition may reproduce the crypto colonial condition that was the case uh, back in the day. Now, I'm not saying that it will do that, but all I was trying to say is to raise, you know, an alarmist kind of voice that, you know, that we kind of have to take that into account when we set up research projects. Another question is, what evidence have you found about Finley's collection of activities in the archive? Do you think it would be possible to identify objects in the BSC collection and their provenance in excavation or purchase by usual archival evidence? That's an easy answer. I have no idea. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, it's the answer. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, I, I have no idea in the sense I, I haven't studied it. Uh, but the point is that, uh, I mean, Michael Lowy would be the best one probably to answer that question. Uh, there is a lot of material, archaeological material, um, uh, that in the Finley collection. And of course, that's a side, not sad part, side part, but like a very important part of the Finley collection. And please visit us. <laughs> I mean, I think the what you're saying is exactly the same kind of thing as we, we talk about in archaeology. You can't understand the sight until you go to the site and see the photography and smell the, the air. The but I mean, so, so but presumably, you can create some sort of color for digital archives. You can, you can set a context, you can create a context yeah. for people so that it, it, it's not completely uh, in isolation. So what would that be? The, the finding aid, the catalog of it actually set that context up. And then, the, yeah, so the catalog and the finding aid set that context up for you. Um, but, the, and this is what happens when we've uh, discussed entirely about a, a digital library, which digital has digital objects as opposed to the context. And if it's not linked to the context, you don't understand that context. You're seeing a digital object outside of that so that's like, I had a similar, uh, and actually my question behind it would be like after the, your experience and, and other digital archives about the decontextualization of it, which is something I think we can both learn in how we display these collections, right? To give the context, but it, it do have digital libraries, which are very, you know, very easy for researchers, but I think there has to be something in between to give them the context and then, you know, and not, have the decontextualization like you mentioned so well, i mean yeah so in, in, so in the particular papers that you have now available online do you also have you know how you how you think it's arriving bsa uh what they think it's doing all of that kind of context as well not yet okay. not yet and that's something we're working on and along with the like transcriptions that we kind of will do i mean it's kind of coming with both ends the transcriptions will make these kind of you know, and of course he's not able to transcribe every single thing in the archives, but then the, having the context of the catalog to tell you, also to tell you the history of the catalog, that we talk about John Husty, who intervened at a much later time that the papers were given, and we have to kind of assess her intervention of where they were before, because, you know, they didn't come off Finley's bookshelves and get placed in the archives, so a lot happened to them, and she it was the last to intervene before we came in. There was other people who intervened before that. So, and 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 that con the, the history of that context we have to present to people yeah. too, because this idea of icing handwriting that's. But, <laughs> but also, if I may just add something, not not just in words, we can actually reproduce that context by using other technical means that we have today, and which can we can actually upload in the collection itself, like small videos or sure. stuff like that, that gives someone a sense of contextualized knowledge. I mean, it's difficult to give it, but at least to give a sense of how things were created, but, you know, just like to feel it in a, in a way, which is, of course, difficult. Thank you. Another question from one? Yeah. Uh, there are at least a couple more. Okay. Uh, one is, um, I was struck by the reason this, about the distinction between uh, the forms and roles of the logbook, journal, diary, and memoir. And uh, the question is, is that a distinction of your own or can you perhaps refer, some, uh, give some other examples? Is this a, a general 
Uh, if, if 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 the question is about sources and references, I don't I don't have something that is coming to my mind right now. But it's in a way it's the the difference among the genres. I think is you know you don't have to theorize it theorize it uh, uh, um, too much because if someone just looks at the law books and journals or like uh, personal notes, they're completely different. So even even the I don't know if people are seeing that online, but even if you see the style of the two, they're completely different. So, and actually at the beginning when I was seeing, I uh, was studying one of the logbooks by Hastings, I was trying to understand what these, all these columns are. So, because also about the handwriting, they would use like a very hand, handwriting for tiny letters. So I was trying to disentangle what, what these were. So the whole writing style is different. And even, even the way that, as you can see, that the pages are structured are different. So there's, as a genre, it is different. And, and uh, the, the, the way that, that they're writing it uh, in it. So I think it's self, kind of self-evident. Now, the problem with us, with me, for example, is to understand sometimes the technical terms that they're having for things naval, for which we have no idea at least trying to understand what they're saying at that moment. And it is interesting also, and I'm going to finish with that, that Schasting was trying to learn at some point the terms that the Greeks were using. And so we have a sketch where he's actually, uh, there's a ship, a vessel, and he's uh, writing the Greek words for different parts of, of the vessel. And many other, in many other cases, trying to understand how the Greeks were, um, uh, what terms the Greeks were using in order for him to understand the Greeks because he was participating in the Greek revolution. He was joining the fleet of the Greeks, so he had to somehow uh, communicate. And the second part of the question oh. is, uh, have you found any references for one, uh, for, for the Hastings case, have you found any references for one record to another from the diary to the law uh, or vice versa? No, I haven't. No. But I'm not saying that there's not such cross references. Yeah, one more question. Can you say a bit about the plans for publication of your findings in book or article? The next book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so there is going to be uh, probably I didn't say that there's going to be an edited volume coming out, hopefully next year, uh, from the BSA in the BSA series. If the BSA accepts uh, the manuscript, uh, the, the proposal. Uh, the, the edit volume is an, a volume that is coming out um, based on the papers that we're giving in the conference. It's not proceedings. We ask people to elaborate on the things that they prepared for the conference, and therefore we'll have an edit volume. Um, as for my own research, there is a, there's going to be a chapter in the book, edit book coming out probably next year, I'm not sure uh, yet. Uh, which is strictly on Finley and his writings uh, during the 1820s. Uh, and I mean, hopefully I can do more research and also find some time to uh, write more. Okay. Right. So I think uh, we're going to end here. Thank you very much.